on Stakes is the third leg of the Triple Crown and it's quickly approaching. It's called the Run for the Carnations and also the Test of Champions. It's a one and one half mile track. Uh, <laughs> it really tests your stamina. There has only been 11 Triple Crown winners in history. The last one was in 1978 and that was affirmed. This is a very exciting year because I'll have another just won the Kentucky Derby and the Preakness and is in uh, in the mix to possibly making history and becoming a Triple Crown winner. Uh, I think <clears throat> horse racing, at least as it is right now, and of course I want to thank everybody for coming, and it is a bigger turnout this year than last year. I wonder why. Uh, horse racing maybe right now could be divided into two times. Uh, the time before June 10th, 1978, and the time after June 10th, 1978, because it was on that day that Affirmed and Alidar squared off for actually their ninth meeting, but the third and most important meeting of what was an incredible slugfest between two sparring partners. They were sort of racing Ali and Frazier as they squared off in the Belmont Stakes, and they had that epic battle, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, which Affirmed came out on top and won the Triple Crown, the third Triple Crown winner in five years, six years of racing. So when Spectacular Bid got to the Belmont Stakes as a one to five favorite in 1979, I think many of you may remember, as many of you are as old as I am, that a lot of people were saying, is the Triple Crown getting too easy? Well, <laughs> as it turned out, it wasn't. Because if a horse like Spectacular Bid, I think one that many of us could argue may have been the greatest horse, certainly of, of my lifetime, if he couldn't win the Triple Crown, just who could? And it turned out that was a very important question because a list that started after Spectacular, or started with him, I should say, and went to Pleasant Colony, Ali Sheba, Sunday Silence, Silver Charm, Real Quiet, Charismatic, War Emblem, Funny Side, Empire Maker, and Big Brown. I mean, you think of the names on that list. These are not random lucky horses. These are some of the best horses that any of us have seen in our lifetimes. Yet all of those horses were good enough to win the first two, and they could not win the third race of the Triple Crown. That is how demanding the entire Triple Crown series is and how demanding the Belmont Stakes is. So when we look ahead and we go towards this Belmont Stakes, we're asking that question of I'll have another. Is he going to be able to add his name to the list that includes the likes of Citation, Count Fleet, Whirl Away, Secretariat, Seattle Slough and Affirmed, or is he going to add his name to the list, a list I mentioned of great horses, but not as great as those Triple Crown winners. And you think about him lining up. It's an odd situation for him because much like Affirmed and Alidar, I'll have another had a great rival in those two races in the Preakness and the Kentucky Derby in Bodie Meister. And some, myself included, felt he was fortunate to beat Bodie Meister in the Kentucky Derby. But the opposite was true in the Preakness where he, Bodie Meister would have been fortunate to beat him because everything went perfectly for Bodie Meister. And I'll have another still was able to run him down in what was one of the most memorable runnings of not just the Preakness, maybe any race I've ever witnessed. And we're very lucky to have a chance for a Triple Crown with I'll Have Another, and it's of course due to his connections and the amazing job they've done with him, and we appreciate everything they've done for the game in the last few weeks and certainly been helpful for us. They're going to line up against, most notably, a couple of horses that skipped the Preakness after running in the Triple Crown, and notable names, Dullahan, who finished third. He's going to take another crack at I'll Have Another after a very, very big workout, and we'll discuss that with Dale Romans in a few moments. And also Union Rags, who was one of the top horses in the country last year, who's had sort of a star-crossed year and a tough trip in the Kentucky Derby. And they're the main contenders, and while Bodie Meister won't be playing, his connections are sending a second stringer, but no lightweight in Painter as well in that race. And it's going to be interesting to see if I'll Have Another can beat those horses and overcome the obstacles that the other 11 we just mentioned, great horses, but not good enough to win the Triple Crown. Let's take a look at a video of I'll Have Another. Bodie Meister is clear by three lengths now to Hansen in second. Trinniburg, I'll have another. Creative Cause is staying on down the outside. Dillahan is also picking up very deep on the track, followed by Liaison inside the final furlong. And it is Bodie Meister and Mike Smith out in front. I'll have another. And Mario Gutierrez now come alongside. Dillahan still has a chance. And then Creative Cause, I'll have another. Takes the lead in the derby and up to the line. I'll have another. Wins the derby. A First winning ride for Mario Gutierrez. It was I'll have another for Doug O'Neill and 25-year-old Mario Gutierrez who took Derby 138. I'll have another third in a
attempting to close, but Bodie Meister gets away, kicks away to a three-length lead. I'll have another is charging on the outside. A furlong left to go. The rematch is on. Bodie Meister. I'll have another on the outside. I'll have another. Bodie Meister. Final finish. I'll have another in Baltimore. I'll have another at Pimlico. I'll have another in the Preakness. On that note, I'd like to bring up Doug O'Neill, the trainer of I'll Have Another, and Mario Gutierrez, the rider of I'll Have Another. I think one of the most memorable moments of this entire Triple Crown, and by the way, congratulations, Thank obviously, you. on your great success, is was, was you talking on the, to the, after, the, after the Kentucky Derby and you talking to the rider. I don't think I've ever seen a more pure emotion of somebody after a victory. And I'm just wondering, even though it's been so, I'm sure it's getting so demanding on you and, and you've been wonderful, obviously, your time, are you getting to enjoy this time at all? Uh, I'm trying my best. I try, of course, I'm trying to enjoy this. is a uh, once in a life opportunity, and uh, I choose. It's a hell of a ride. Uh, being in Tabo, I'll have another. So he choose absolutely um, changed my life. Well, well, deservedly so, because you've been a huge part of that. Uh, you went to the Empire State Building a little earlier today? Yes. Was that, was that exciting? It was good. I probably didn't expect to be there <laughs> <No>. about two <laughs> months ago, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, uh, you're in the Preakness. Um, you came into the stretch and you were behind your main rival, Bodie Meister, and obviously knew where he was and had your sights on him. How confident were you at, at the top of the stretch that you could actually get to him? You know, I um, I got the opportunity to race. I'll have another in Santa Anita, two races, and then the Kentucky. Uh, like I always say, he has a tremendous kick, believe it or not, even if people don't want to believe it. He really kicks like turning for home. And that's, he loves that. Like, you know, he's just waiting for me to ask him, and then he'll go for everything. He doesn't give you 50 or 80 percent. He'll give you the 100. And he's just a fighter. He, he has the biggest heart ever, and um, he's the one that makes me that confident. Well, well, he's, uh, you know, you, you've been as, as good as I'll have another has been. Uh, if you, now, you, your, your schedule ride as many as five horses on Friday at Belmont. Have you been over the track at all in the mornings uh, since you've been to town? I just got, <clears throat> I was there this morning, I just went to see, I'll have another for a little bit. Uh, he looks great. And then I, I came here. I, I'm going to make a suggestion. John Velasquez, don't listen to anything he tells you about riding Belmont, but Richard Migliori, who won't be riding in the race, he's your guy, <laughs> all right? Mario, thanks a lot for coming here, and uh, best of luck. I'm going, to, I'm going to try, Doug, not to ask you stuff, all the same questions that everybody has been boring you with. For we want to look through and figure out the ones that you can, if you could read them. Are, are, have you, have you, have you been able? I mean, it, it, has it hit you that this is like this is as good as it, it gets? I mean, this is such an amazing, great time for you. It is. I mean, you can see why guys like Dale Romans and Baffert and Pletcher and you know uh, show up to these races every year with top horses because it doesn't get any better than this. Yeah, and it's been, it's been an, obviously a very exciting time for us. Now, I'll have another, and I, I, I imagine a lot of people are aware of this. This is not his first trip to New York, because the last time that I'll have another ran a poor race was in the slop on closing day at Saratoga. Um, what, what were your, it, it, you've only run about 10 or 11 horses uh, in New York in the last five years. Maryfield actually won the ballerina, I think was the only one that won. Um, what was your thinking in bringing I'll have another across the country to run at Saratoga? Well, we were thinking after he ran second to uh, um, Creative Cause and the Best Pal that he was a, a Breeders' Cup kind of caliber horse, and, and um, we wanted to try the hopeful, and, and if he ran good there, obviously the next stop was going to be the Breeders' Cup, but he had a trouble trip and then came out of that with sore shins, and we stopped on him, gave him time, and so far so good. Yeah, so that, and now uh, we're, we're expecting great weather Saturday, so you're not going to have to answer that question about the slop, but I know you weren't particularly worried about it and felt it was an issue with the horses more than the, the weather because it was sloppy that day in the hopeful. Yeah, he's uh, through this journey, he's galloped over a lot of uh, sloppy tracks and it hasn't seemed to change his stride or his, uh, his energy or his will, so uh, I don't think it'll be a problem. When, when it, a lot of us, my, myself included, when you ran, he ran a tremendous race this year, first time in, in the Bob Lewis, and then you announced you weren't going to run him again for two months in the Saturday Night Derby. Genius that I am, I said, well, that kills that horse's chances because he has no idea. I mean, obviously, this plan has worked to perfection. Is this something you had thought about for a long, long time, or was it just a feeling after the Bob Lewis? Uh, you know, it's, it's funny because um, after a race like the Bob Lewis, I would have wagered that my brother Dennis and Paul Redham and I would have been on different pages. But, uh, I mean, it was minutes after that where we all said, 
wow, you know, that was such a huge effort off five months. We've got the Sandia Derby in nine weeks. Let's let him recover from that and uh, and just shoot for the Sandia Derby. And we all agreed. And and uh, so it's so rare in this game that you have a plan and it works out. But uh, it has worked out perfectly so far. In racing, we're always, we always look stupid, but very, very occasionally we manage to look very clever. Exactly. You, of course, are the cleverest guy on earth right now. Yeah. Who, who do you fear the most in the, in the Belmont right now? You may not be in a few days, but right now, well, hopefully you will be. But. Dale's a big guy, and he's right in front of me, so I better say Dale. <coughs> Kenny's, Kenny's pretty big, too. Kenny's pretty big, too. He's a little bit farther back, so I can run away from Kenny. His horses are a little slower. Than well, that, too. That, too. Um, you know, I actually, uh, I respect uh, Dale and Kenny's horse a ton, but I just, my biggest fear is I'll have another waking up with a headache or something and not feeling like running. But I think if he shows up and, and uh, runs his race, I think he's going to be very tough to beat. I don't think anybody, any sane person could argue that. Thanks so much. Thank you. And Thank you. Best of luck. You Thanks a lot for coming. For the few of you that were loyal enough to actually be here last year, you got, had the pleasure of hearing our next guest, Dale Romans, put on quite a show. I don't know if he can live up to last year's performance, but uh, his horse Dullahan perhaps can live up to it as well. And let's take a little look at Dullahan, who is the second choice, in my opinion, to I'll have another. I know he is overseas. Let's take a look at him right now. Two length lead as they come toward the eighth pole. Gung Ho still trying, but still second. Perspective getting shook loose late, so is Dullahan. Dullahan down the center of the racetrack. Hanson in the final furlong. Dullahan charging on the outside. Doolahan, tremendous stretch run. He was 10th with three furlongs to go. It's, of course, that's Doolahan winning the, uh, it's Dull, it's, we've discussed this at dinner, right? It's Doolahan, we, we think it's Doolahan, but it could be Doolahan. They can call whatever they want. Anybody here speak Gaelic? Do you speak Gaelic? <laughs> Jake? <laughs> Doolahan, okay, Jake's always right. In 30 years, Jake will have the unfortunate pleasure of being me. <laughs> Um, you can use that mic, Dale. You can move it up if you want. Yeah. Or something. Uh, you, you're in the position to, to, to change history and, and beat all of another going for the Triple Crown. And obviously, you're aware of the importance of a Triple Crown. Do, do you go into the race with any mixed emotions? None at all. None at all. Uh, like I said, I'd like to have 120,000 people booing me on the way out of Belmont Park. Uh, I can handle it. But, you know, it's, uh, those are great horses that won a Triple Crown. And I don't think that... Uh, Dennis or, or Paul Radham, their horse, their, their sportsmen, they want to earn it, and uh, we owe it to the past Triple Crown winners to make him earn it. And, and, and now, did you always intend to skip the Preakness, or was that just sort of a feeling after the Derby? Well, it, it wasn't my plan, it was my owner's plan. I wanted to run into Preakness, I, w I wanted to hit all Triple Crown races, but Jerry thought that it gave us our best chance to win a Triple Crown race by skipping, just waiting for this race, give me a little more time to prepare to go the mile and a half. After the way the race set up in the Preakness, I think he was right, and I think that we did the right thing. And, and I would say his workout, um, let's talk about that a little bit the other day, and for people that don't know, he worked uh, under 46 seconds, uh, just an incredible workout at Belmont Park. Uh, he worked fast before the bluegrass. You're not concerned it was too fast, are you? No, he's trained super ever since he's been here, and uh, the work the other day, was it was fast, but it was well in hand. Anybody who watched it, it looked like he was going in 49. And uh, that's all we cared about, that he, that he was doing it comfortably. We wanted to get a good crisp work in him, but didn't want to be pushing on him, just wanted him to do it on his own, and he did exactly what we were looking for. In, in that kind of work, are you, or any of your thoughts when you work that quickly, that while he's somewhat, he's not a plotting closer, but he's a deeper closer, are you concerned that he'll need to be more forwardly placed in this race, or do you think the mile and a half will take care of that anyway? I think the mile and a half will take care of it. He's not a plotter in any way. I mean, he's got a great turn of foot. The race we just watched, he went to last eighth and under 12, and that was the fastest closing of any prep for the Kentucky Derby. Um, the work before the, the bluegrass, he worked in 57, and like the announcer just said, he was 10th at the 3 8 pole. So he'll do whatever the jockey wants him to do. I just want our jack to be comfortable with where he is and, uh, and how much horse he has under him. He's an unusual horse in that he is obviously extremely talented on every surface. He's run very well on the turf. He's run extraordinarily well on the poly track at Keeneland, and he's now run very well on the dirt. What do you think his best surface is? Uh, Belmont Dirt. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Um, if he wins the Belmont chance, he'll be the Virginia Derby. <laughs> His next well, start trying that one out. We can <laughs> right. show up over there. It was a million. You exactly. would miss it. There's right. never yeah. been a million no dollar way. race. You didn't want to run it. I Our final guest is trainer Ken McPeak. Now, Ken McPeak has a couple of horses in this race. Uh, Adagon and Unstoppable You. I'm not 
We'll talk to Ken about this a little bit. It's not you, you, have you made a firm decision on him yet? We'll get to that. Uh, but we'll look, take a look at a little video of Adagun and Unstoppable You before bringing up Ken McPeak. Attigan has made a huge move to take the lead. He goes on now with a following and a half ahead of them. Politically Correct is in second. Slam it to the inside is in third. A Ford is back in fourth, racing down towards the final 16th. Attigan is out in front by a length and a half. Politically Correct tries to come back, but from last to first to winner's circle, Attigan wins the Derby Day opener. Trainer Ken McPeak came to Belmont Park in, I think, 2002. Uh, in a race that War Emblem was trying to become a triple, 12th Triple Crown winner. And Ken had a seemingly hopeless looking long shot on paper coming off a win named Sarava. And while War Emblem didn't run well, a second place finisher, Medaglia Doro, who was a monster in his own right, did run well, but not as well as Sarava. So when you look at the PPs of Ken's two horses, think back to Sarava. Ken McPeak, ladies and gentlemen. Give us, tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are because you're not, you're still on the fence a little bit with Unstoppable You. Well, this is an extremely talented horse, but he's not that seasoned. Um, you know, and I think it's one of those deals, is it a, um, you get one chance. And so we're, we're really milling it over. We, we, made the, we made the wire today, so we've got the option to do it in the morning. Um, if, I say, if I say right now which way I'm going, I'd probably be saying I'm leaning towards running him. But um, we've got till tomorrow, we're gonna watch him. This is, I mean, he is a big, strong, serious kind of horse, but he's never run at this level. And the races he's run, he's done it easily. He's never been outworked and he's never been outrun, but he's never run in a graded race. Um, so at this stage, we'll see. Well, he's a likely speed horse, so maybe when you look back, you think of Datara, who is the winner of the race that Big Brown was in, and maybe, I mean, there's some other speeds in here, but perhaps he's a horse that would find himself on the front end, more so than Adagon, who has the opposite running style. I think, he, I think he's a 12 horse. So, you know, he ran 48 and three in a headwind in his last race. Mm -hmm. And he's the kind of horse that's going to grind his way around there. I don't know necessarily that it's going to be on the lead. We'll see. Um, if, he, if he does go, and it's assuming we do put him in tomorrow, then I would love to draw outside of Painter. But, uh, you know, this is a weird race. Um, and Sarava proved it. Datara proved it. So a lot of things can happen. We need some improvement not only from Madigan. We need, you know, some serious improvement from, from this other call on numbers, on paper. Sure. But uh, up to this point, nobody's really looked him in the eye in the morning or the afternoon, so we'll see. Well, distance can be the great equalizer in horse racing, and being the fastest horse going a mile and a quarter doesn't necessarily make you the fastest horse in a mile and a half. Like Dale, uh, obviously Dale's running a much shorter priced horse in Dullahan than you, but do you have any thoughts about, or you're, I mean, you obviously want to win, but how, how do you feel about facing off against a Triple Crown hopeful? Well, I have no fear. I mean, you know, you can in this game, and, and a lot, like I said, a lot of things happen. It's a, it's a great sport because it's a, you never know. You really don't ever know. If you've got one that's eating well, he's doing well, you've got a client who wants to play the game, um, that's what it's all about. Um, I'll probably never be a 25% trainer because I'm probably more of a home run hitter than a singles and a double. But um, Mr. Anthony's won this race with Temperance Hill at 50 to 1. I won it at 70 to 1. Um, we're going to probably be 50 to 1 and 70 to 1 this weekend, so we'll see. Well, Alan Jerkins and, and Nick Zito have pulled off some amazing upsets and mm -hmm. races by running horses a lot of other people wouldn't have run. Let, let's sort of talk about something else for a second. You have a, have a new uh, venture called HorseRacesNow.com that you've just started. Why, why don't you tell people about it, get people familiar with it, because it's a very exciting project. Well, I'm glad you said that. Um, it's one of the crazier things I've ever been involved in. Um, I'll be honest with you, I was sitting at home one night watching a show called Planet of the Apps on MSNBC. And while we were watching the show, or I was watching with a buddy, and I said, well, let's Google horse racing apps. Well, we couldn't find any. <laughs> Unless baseball apps, football apps, basketball apps, had badminton apps, water polo apps, no horse racing apps. So I made a couple phone calls and checked around and said, well, maybe, maybe somebody needs to do this. So we came up with a little idea and put it on paper and presented it to an app developer. And they said, well, we think we can make that for about 45,000. That's my payroll for a week. <laughs> That's Dale's payroll plus for That's, a week. That's right, Dale's Dale? dinner check for a you week. You know, we do that, right? A week, and we got a lot of people. We hand, we, we hand out, uh, feed a lot of mouths. But anyway, so I decided to do it. I said, okay, we're going to hire a developer and we're going to see if we can, we can, we want to put favorites in there so you can put your favorite horses, trainers, jockeys, racetracks, and all you got to do is plug them in and then you get these push notifications, these silly little sounds that come through the phone. Call to post, you get at the gate, you get the result, you get the replay and the video, the video from the racetracks that are kind enough to put it on there. 
And so that, would, that new, would include the New York Racing Association. Nara, Nara's, Nara's given us replays, but they haven't given us live. But now the 45,000's turned into 300 and change. Okay? So, and, and, and Sue is um, involved in it as well. And it's a, you know what? I made a lot of money in this game. I've done really well. If that's something, I, even if I'd never make a dime on it, this sport needs to expand itself. We need to get a different way to get into the heads of kids. But our next guest is a particularly special guest this year, and it's John Velasquez, who is the rider of Union Rags. And first, let's take a little look at some footage of Union Rags, who is by many considered the favorite, the early favorite for this year's Kentucky Derby. Union Rags is just starting to get underway now, but Union Rags will have to find a way through as they come to the top of the stretch. And it's right the vote, the leader in the champagne as they turn for home. On the outside, takes the gold, Union Rags looks for a way through down inside. Now he looks for the way through outside into the final furlong, Alpha kicking in. And now there's running room for Union Rags, and Union Rags is full of run. Right to vote and Alpha, Union Rags to Breeders' Cup Riches. A five-length winner of the Champagne Stake. Back to Union Rags. When is the first time that you, you've ridden him? And give us some of your impressions of having gotten on him, what you're thinking about him. I just got on him last, uh, last Sunday, and it was very impressive the way he did everything. Um, I couldn't ask for a better work. Just like Dale said, he, his horse did work really well, and didn't ask him to do anything. I, I didn't do anything to him. I just basically hold him behind all the horse and let him do his stand and pull him out on the eight pole, let him... Let him stretch his legs and he worked really easy. Very, very easy. Very, very impressive. Have you given a lot of thought or talked to Michael Match, the trainer, about where you see him placed in this race? Because he is a horse that has an enormous amount of natural speed. No, we haven't. Um, we really haven't sat down and looked at it. I, I mean, I, I want to wait and see uh, and really sit down and see the past performance from the other horses and everything. I, but I'm pretty sure he just wanted to have a, a clean trip with the horse and give it a better <laughs> chance. Obviously, he's not been very lucky the last two races. And um, by the way, D Doug, I, I have the raining gods to bring rain for the side of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> bring in wet. Bring in wet. <laughs> 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 I'm invited this <laughs> trip. <laughs> so, there will not be any rain. I love the wet. So, <laughs> and I know my horse love the wet. So, no, I'm kidding. The, uh, but, Union Rags ran yeah. an amazing race yes. at Saratoga in the yes, slot. So, that's where I'm coming from to that. So. <laughs> Unlike all uh, another. It's uh, a different exactly. race. But. <laughs> different race, yes. Um, no, no, but back to him. I mean, he's worked really well. Uh, I, I think. Uh, He's been very unlucky the last two races, and, and, and hopefully we get a better trip in, at the Belmont. And, you know, we are in the same boat like everybody else. Uh, we haven't run them on a half. Uh, do we uh, handle them on a half or not? I, I think we'll see on Saturday, you know? Yeah, well, obviously we'll find out. Mm -hmm. Now, it's sort of interesting. Your, your first Kentucky Derby success, and you'd won, of course, the rags to riches we saw in the Belmont, was on Animal Kingdom. And up until about a week before the race, you were riding Uncle Mo, and you picked him up late. And obviously that worked out very well for Animal Kingdom as well as you, because you gave him one of your patented great rides, and it worked out really well. So maybe maybe the way things are working out, if you do rags wins this race, you should just tell your agent you just want to be be open now going into the I triple crown yeah, race. I want to wait until the last minute to pick up and out, right? And that's the, that's the way I look at it. You know, I've been very lucky with that, and uh, normally I say to an angel, like, let's, let's try to open, you know, stay open in these kind of races, and hopefully something come up, you know, and eventually something come up, though, you know, and, and if, he, if he people wants me, that, that's the way, you know, it shows up. Well, actually, that, that may have been somewhat the case with Rags to Riches, even, right? Because Garrett Gomez had ridden her, yeah, right? And yes. he was committed to yes. hard spun, so that's yeah. how you ended up I riding was, her. I was pot. committed to somebody else and, and the race, and then when he came up open, uh, um, the trainer that I was riding for, he allowed me to, you know, to go and ride uh, uh, Rock Station. So it was, I was very lucky that day. Yeah. Well, you, you, as a rider, all riders, especially of your yeah. caliber, deserve all the luck they could get because you'll <laughs> encounter you. plenty of bad luck in this game <laughs> as well. But we appreciate your coming up. And Thank once you. again, congratulations on the, on the Hall Thank of Fame. You. With Hall of Famer John Velasquez. First of all, who did you look up to? I mean, being in the Hall of Fame, was, it, was there a certain jockey that well, you I, I mean, I, it's obviously, you know, I came here with Daniel Cordero when I came to New York, and uh, he was the one who brought me here. So I, he was a jockey that I looked up for many years, and I still do, you know, and um, he was uh, uh, the guy coming from Puerto Rico, and uh, he was the guy that I looked up from from, from, from the very, very beginning. And now... Tell us a little bit, a bit about Union Rags and, and, and this race. T tell me about the horse, his disposition, uh, temperament. Uh, he's 
great horse. I mean, I I got on him just one last week and uh, last Sunday, and he showed everything. A lot of class, very strong horse, very uh, very calm. I mean, I, he, they, they told me he was he probably was going to be a little nervous horse. He was not. You know, he was very calm, and very strong, and very focused on what he was ne- what he needed to do. Um, so I hope that he can come to the race and do the same thing. Now nobody's been able to beat. Uh, I have another. Do you have a? Uh, I know you don't want to reveal too much of your strategy, but uh, do you have a little strategy going here? Well, my, my strategy is trying to follow that horse, and you know, hopefully I can get him down the lane. Though you know, the whole thing is watch out for him, and hopefully my horse allowed me to do the things that I wanted to do with him, uh, and and hopefully he handled it the a mile and a half. Though you know, so if we can do that, I think we'll be in good shape. And and, and just to end this. Belmont Stakes, a mile and a half. Could you tell our audience out there that might not be aware about the track and what, well, what the makes is, this so difficult? It's so difficult, a mile and a half, and they don't run these races uh, very often. And these horses are so young, they never run the, the, the distance before, so they, they don't train for it, though. You know, So that's why it makes it so difficult. And uh, uh, when, they, when they go on and race a mile and a half, this is for the first time. So whatever hands it, like, it's going to be the winner, though. You know, And... Uh, you know, they got to be a lot of patient. You know, you got as a, as a jockeys, you got to be patient and, and not push the button too soon on the horses. So you you have something left to run down the lane. No, I have heard that uh, I'll have another was sort of trained for distance. Uh, is, uh, what about Union well, Rack? I'm pretty sure everybody, you know, all the trainers are doing the same thing. Though. You know, they're, try, <laughs> they're trying to train to handle them on a half, and but it, it, nobody knows until they run it. Though. You know, they're going to train for it. You know, uh-huh. they're going to prepare it for it. Until, but, the, uh, you know, right now, you know, that none of them are bright to go a mile and a half. Though, you know, so, um, and that's the way it goes. They train for it now. You know, they kind of prepare and go into the mile and a half, but we don't know until they run. And do you have a prediction? Ah, the prediction is that I'm going to win it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we like that yeah. prediction. Yes. Somebody, I, I there go. may not be a triple crown winner. That's right. I, I am, I, I'm going for, for, for all of it. <laughs> win it. Thank you. Thank you. And that he did. John Velasquez riding Union Rags was the winner of the 2012 Belmont Stakes. As for I'll Have Another, it wasn't his fate to win the triple crown. He scratched the eve of the race with a swollen left front tendon. And what's next for all you horse racing fans? It's Saratoga. Yes, Saratoga, and that runs through Labor Day. And that's all the time we have for this show. I'm Crystal Hart. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you at Saratoga.